Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It gives you the tools and inspiration to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. This is where we explore how to cultivate remarkable cultures, cultures that scale and evolve as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. So I think the main obstacles are old ways of thinking and old ways of, you know, running organizations. I think hierarchical structures, like outdated systems and beliefs about what work is are really kind of getting in, in the way of us moving forward to create this thing that we're talking about now. And I think really what we need to develop is a, a true understanding of the inherent link between well-being and high performance. And how, obviously, when we are allowing people to live up to their potential, that is an outcome of that thing. And so it's even more about delving deeper into understanding what the foundations are that we need to create and sustain within organizations that support human flourishing. And I feel that that is really getting in the way. You know, some organizations are doing great in certain areas, but not in others. And we really need to look at the holistic approach to to what supports human flourishing. Hey friends, welcome to episode 114 of the Culture Lab podcast. This episode is brought to you by Culture Brain, a -a one-of-a-kind accelerator program where culture leaders get hands-on support and guidance on how to reach their goals faster, especially now in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. CultureBrain connects you with outstanding peers on the same journey, but also with world-class experts, including people you know from the show. And they all help you identify and implement new, better ways of creating a culture where people do their best work. Check it out at tinyurl.com forward slash culturebrain. And no need to write it down. There's a link in the show notes. So I've been thinking and reflecting a lot on the history and nature of work recently. Because work, as we know it today, is actually a relatively new invention. But working together towards common goals has been the biggest evolutionary advantage of our species, more so than our intelligence, it turns out. Our ancestors, hunters and gatherers, basically engaged in it for hundreds of thousands of years before we discovered agriculture. So hunting and gathering basically ensured survival, but it was also a source of fun, meaning and belonging for Homo sapiens. And it was the foundation of their well-being. And it's really hard to ignore the gap between what working together used to be for our ancestors and what it has become today. And closing this gap and cultivating cultures where well-being is the norm is actually the focus of my conversation today with my guest, Teresa Clark. Teresa is the founder of the Wellbeing Revolution. And she has been recognized as one of the UK's most influential mental health experts by the Inside Out Leaderboard. Over the last 12 years, Teresa has worked tirelessly to break down the stigma around mental health across the criminal justice system, the NHS, and both the private and charity sectors. She has a very powerful personal story of grief, loss, and incarceration that led her to what she does today, helping businesses to transform culture, enhance employee experience, and prioritize employee well-being. Therese actually shares her story on this episode, as well as her thoughts on how to cultivate a culture where people can thrive. So with no further ado... Here is Teresa Clark. My name's Teresa Clark, and I am the founder and the alchemist of the Wellness Revolution. We're an employee well-being and culture company revolutionizing the workplace to unleash human potential. I just have to ask, why an alchemist? So an alchemist is somebody 
that transforms energy. And I think that's exactly what I do with the wellness revolution. And also I've done that in my own personal journey of alchemizing emotions and trauma to find my own purpose in life. And so it really just resonates with me, the whole concept of, you know, what we do when we transform our own energy and the energy around us. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Thank you for that clarification and welcome again to the Culture Lab podcast. Thank you for having me, Agra. I'm excited to be here with you today. Same here, Teresa. And we've already done some work together for the Culture Brain community. So I know that this is going to be a really interesting conversation on a topic that is near and dear to our hearts, wellness in the workplace. And I'm really keen to dive straight into it. But there is one question that I ask all of my guests. So I'm going to present you with this question as well. And it's a question about the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person. What were they and how did they impact you? I would say that initially I grew up in a very, very small town and I always didn't feel like I belonged there. And I really knew that I was very different. And I think just sort of understanding that there was sort of so much more than I could see really led me down a different path of of thinking outside of the box and, you know, wanting to be around sort of diverse people and have new experiences. And then later on in my life, um, when I was 27 years old, I had a really serious car accident. And that just gave me such a different perspective on life. And Sadly, I lost three of my friends in that car accident and I was responsible and I I actually went to prison and prison was an awful experience, but it was also incredibly humbling because I was then around people that in my normal life, I never really would have had connection with. But when I went there, I just realized that we're all the same and that different life circumstances have led us down different paths and it really gave me such a different perspective on life and how I lived my life after that. I certainly didn't expect that answer, Teresa. That's something that I was not aware of at all. Thank you for sharing that. And oh my gosh, what an experience to have. I just want to follow a little bit down this path, if you don't mind, because it sounds like such a powerful experience to have. And you've already shared a little bit about how that shaped you. What was the experience of reintegration after you? How long were you in prison, first of all? I was in prison for two years. And the reintegration, actually, Aga, was very difficult. I didn't really think about what my life would be like afterwards. I think I was so kind of focused on or overwhelmed by what had happened and dealing with everything that I didn't really know what my life would be like afterwards. And actually coming home, I felt so different. I went back to that small town I spoke about and I just didn't fit there even more. You know, I'd changed so much and I'd grown so much and been through so much that it was a very difficult time. And um, what got me through it was the work that I was doing. When when I was in prison, I started to volunteer for the Samaritans. And that's how I went into my career in mental health. I was very lucky to be given a role. I was volunteering for a mental health charity while I was there. My manager at the time really believed in me and he asked me to apply for this role. And it was um, developing a service to support offenders on release from prison and then I would help them get housing and things like that. So I threw myself into my work because it was the only thing that really gave me meaning. It gave me a reason to get out of bed in the morning. I could feel like I was giving something back, but going home every night to this small town was just very, very difficult. Did you eventually leave and move somewhere where you felt more belonging or more freedom? Yes, I I moved to London a few years afterwards and it was really then that I started to to I guess really go deeper into my healing and and could sort of explore who I was and what my kind of role was in life. Again, thank you for sharing this experience and it makes total sense to me now why you would be on this path 
I really appreciate what you've mentioned about the role that work played for you in your reintegration process, but also really in healing from the trauma that you went through. And I really don't think that we always appreciate what a powerful healing force work can be for people. I certainly had a very similar experience as a young person because I've actually always found refuge in some sort of creative activities, even when I was a kid. And I think at some point in your life, the creative things that you do, if you are lucky, starts being called work. And so for me personally, working, creating businesses and doing what I do for a job has always been a part of my personal healing journey and a part of my growing up process as well. We are currently at a stage where probably the majority of the population, if we ask them what works means to them, sadly, a lot of people would probably say it's a paycheck. It's a necessary evil. And this really saddens me because I know deep down in my gut, based on my personal experience, but also what I've learned about the history of work, that this is definitely not work is supposed to be. And we had this conversation before we record this podcast, where we talked about what human beings are wired for and the role that work played in the hunter-gatherer life, for example. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, historically work has been, like you say, to have a paycheck and it's been very much sort of founded in the beginnings of the industrial revolution. And, you know, we work for somebody else to make money and it's got really twisted, I think. But ultimately, human beings find purpose and meaning through their work. And I want to kind of bring bring that to volunteering. I don't know if you've ever volunteered or I know in my own journey that actually volunteering, when I did something that was just purely giving and not expecting anything in return, it just made such a difference to my concept of, you know, self and to, you know, being a part of something much bigger than myself. And I think actually we've got it all wrong when it comes to work. If we can create workplaces that have a higher purpose, that have a reason for existing beyond maximizing profits, then everybody's going to benefit from that. We've just got lost in almost like crony capitalism. And that's really distorted our perception of what actually work is and how work can be so beneficial for human fulfillment. Yeah. And it's interesting to me that you've mentioned volunteering, where obviously it's the least transactional of the interactions that we can have where we actually offer our labor or our time. As you say, we don't expect anything in return. And it made me think immediately of the early, early stages of humans and their development and our civilization's development when we were hunters and gatherers and lived in tribes. And basically, I think no one actually went hunting or gathering because they expected an immediate return, it was just a way to make sure that everyone in the tribe was being taken care of, a way to survive. There was clearly a common goal. And that experience, I can only imagine, we unfortunately don't have written records of how these people hundreds of thousands of years ago experience that. Uh, but we do know, though, from tribes like Hadza tribe in Tanzania, for example, who still live a hunter-gatherer life, that for them, it's simply unthinkable to have that transactional relationship in their tribe where, you know, you do something only because you expect something in return. And this is what work and the contract around the work has ended up being, as you say, in the industrial era. So do you think that this can change? There is a possibility there for this contract to change. You've mentioned, of course, purpose and the importance of that. But I'm curious what else might evolve to help us go back to that sense of work that feels more natural and more generous? In answer to your question, yes, I do think it can change. And I think that why it's going to change and, and why it is changing now is because we are becoming more conscious as a species. 
business in itself is becoming more conscious. And we're starting to understand that when we create cultures and experiences that actually look after our people and make them happy and have a ripple effect in society, the business benefits. And there's so much research now showing that businesses who or organizations that operate in this way have huge profits, so many positive outcomes, because they are shifting the perspective that business only exists to maximize profits. And they're thinking about how they can influence and encourage growth on a holistic level. There is a movement called the Conscious Capitalist Movement, which it, it about exactly this, which is leaders starting to understand and becoming more conscious of their selves and, you know, what they're bringing to the world and organizations actually being created to make the world a better place rather than selling things that we don't really need and that it's just a way to take our money. I think there is, it is a huge movement at the moment and COVID, AI, all of these things are actually pushing us more to understand how we can live more purposefully and find more meaning in our work. Absolutely. Really, these trends are converging right now. And there is this huge opportunity for work to become something completely different. Because as you say, it seems like AI very shortly is really going to take over all the repetitive, boring work that human beings never enjoyed doing. And we will be free to spend our time on things that only humans can do and things that truly require tapping into the fullest human potential because machines will be able to do and robots will be able to do everything else so much better than us. And so if we want to thrive as a species, we really need to become more of what we are. And for me, that's, that's a wonderful opportunity. How do you see that? And what do you think are the optimistic scenarios for the evolution of the workplace? There's just so much opportunity for us. And I like to look at where we are today as the age of human potential. And, you know, what does that actually mean? How can we really live up to our potential in terms of self-actualization as individuals and within organizations? And I like to sort of look back to ancient Greek philosophy and Aristotle coined this phrase eudaimonia, which is actually translated as happiness, prosperity, and sort of describes a very like overarching and very intricately networked way of viewing human flourishing. And I think that this is, is where the real possibilities lie in how do we create this now? You know, like you say, AI is going to take away all those menial jobs and allow us to actually really explore what our unique talents are. You know, human beings are incredible. And when you take away all that stuff, we, it leaves us this space to actually dig into our creativity and collaboration. You know, by ourselves, we are so creative, but when we come together, we are even more creative. And what we can do as a species collectively. I, mean, I, I think it's a very exciting time. Yes, I think so too. And of course, we can mess it up. We're capable of that. And so I'm very much aware of the fact that the optimistic scenario is not the only scenario for the evolution of work. But I do have a huge dose of optimism, just as you say, observing the movement and the trends and the commitment so many people have to a better future of work. And by the way, I just want to pick up your point about eudaimonia. I don't think that a lot of our listeners know that I'm a fluent speaker of Greek. My husband is Greek and I, I live in Greece now, actually. And it's interesting because in Greek, actually, evdemonia, as Greeks pronounce it, it means to be in sync with your demon. And the demon in ancient Greece was really the positive part of us, our best self. And so it's all about fulfilling our potential and that sense of human flourishing where there is this deep belief that we are capable of so much more typically than who we are and what we can do today. And human life is basically a journey of 
constantly, hopefully getting closer to that positive demon, that ideal self that, that everyone should be striving to become. And again, you know, back to our initial point about work, I know, and I've seen this happen for me and for others around me, that work is one of the factors. I'm not saying that it's the only avenue to achieve that, but it's certainly one of incredibly important areas for human beings to, to align with their best self and explore what it is. So great opportunities there. And I think we have set really nice nice context and have given a really nice frame to our conversation in terms of what's possible. So I want us to shift gears a little bit and become a little bit more practical and talk about, right, so since we have this potential for human flourishing in the workplace, how do we go about creating this environment today? And I think one of the first places that I would like us to explore together with the lens of your expertise is what are the main barriers? Because theoretically speaking, right, we could already have this amazing workplace where humans can flourish. But clearly, something's in the way and something's holding us back. From your perspective, what are those obstacles? So I think the main obstacles are old ways of thinking and old ways of you know, running organizations, I think hierarchical structures, outdated systems and beliefs about what work is are really kind of getting in, in the way of us moving forward to create this thing that we're talking about now. And I think really what we need to develop is a, a true understanding of the inherent link between well-being and high performance and how obviously when we are allowing people to live up to their potential, that is an outcome of that thing. And so it's even more about delving deeper into understanding what the foundations are that we need to create and sustain within organizations that support human flourishing. And I feel that that is really getting in the way. You know, some organizations are doing great in certain areas, but not in others. And we really need to look at the holistic approach to, to what supports human flourishing. Is it that we want our staff to have great well-being, but what does that actually look like? And how do we tangibly create that, those environments? You know, what psychological safety do we have in our organization? Because if we don't have that as a baseline, then we can never allow our people to reach their potential because there's so many things that get in the way. And I think that's really what the problem is. It's, it's truly understanding what all of those factors mean and then really looking at the organizational structure and seeing where we're allowing and where we're resisting and then, you know, making really big leaps to tackle those systemic things that are getting in the way. So you've mentioned that one of the obstacles is lack of psychological safety, for example, in the workplace, outdated systems and beliefs about work. Can you give us a few examples of outdated beliefs or systems that stand in the way of well-being in the workplace? We're shifting one of them at the moment is that like work has to be in the office and that you have to come in and you have to sit at your desk and you have to work nine to five. You know, they're the outdated systems that we are starting to shift, but there's still quite a lot of resistance in terms of people wanting employees to come back to the workplace because they believe that people can only work in that way. Now, there is a lot of movement now that we're seeing that you know, organizations going completely remote and how that is impacting people's well-being individually, but also shifting organizations into new to new worlds. So that's that's one example that I could give. I think another example is like those hierarchical structures again, where it's top down and looking at something like a tier organization, which is decentralized, where we don't need loads of managers because we trust our employees and we know that they are going to do their job. So everybody kind of manages themselves. And I think that is another new system that we are going to see being integrated more into organizations. And then we'll be seeing the benefits of, of what that does. I wonder if you have any thoughts around how to dismantle these outdated systems or ways of thinking and approaching, uh, thinking about work and approaching work. Because I know that a lot of our listeners, just sophisticated audience, they've reflected a lot on the nature of work 
And yet, I think for many of us, it's not entirely clear where do we start, right? And what would be the next good step in our organizations to start moving the needle in the right direction? What are your thoughts? What do you see out there? What do organizations do that genuinely had major positive impact on employee well-being and as a result on business performance? The biggest thing that I've seen that really, really does shift organizations is taking a design thinking approach to culture and really looking and asking what is going on? How can we make things better? Where are we falling short? Where are we doing well? And then really redesigning every step of the employee experience. When we take that kind of approach, it has multiple benefits on on so many levels because we're really actually understanding what our values are, what the beliefs are within our organization and what the behaviors are. And if we can adjust those to tie back into our our values and make sure that they're fully in alignment, then that's where we start to see some real shifts within organizations because we're not just ticking a box or running a little program here or there. We're actually really getting to the crux of how we want people to experience work. What do we want the outcomes to be? And how can we craft the experience of work to ensure that these things are being, you know, made manifest. And in your experience, when this design thinking is put into place in organizations and organizations really delve deep into what is needed so that it can accomplish its goals, but also create an environment where people can do the best work of their careers, Do you see any trends? Like, do you see any commonalities as to what companies find needs to change or practices that they tend to implement as a result? Yes, I think the biggest thing is looking at the role that leadership plays within that organization. That's a big trend. And I think understanding how much influence leaders have on people's performance and that how actually many of the leaders that come into leadership positions haven't had necessarily people training or they don't understand lots of the factors that we need different hats to lead these days. You know, we need to understand self-awareness. We need emotional intelligence. We need conflict resolution. We need to understand how to motivate and empower people. And they're not always things that we have gifted with. We have to learn those. So I think we, we see a real trend in the knowledge gaps there and how that's kind of influencing what's happening within the culture. I think a big one that we see a lot, which I've mentioned and touched on already, is the psychological safety element of organizations and how that's foundational to everything. We see also that trust is quite a big issue and how organizations can create more trust. Actually, we see lots of patterns. We see how resistant people are to change and how human beings, even though we crave change and we want change, we find it very difficult to manage. So I feel that there's organizations still struggle with getting the change element right and how through communication and fostering more trust by being more transparent, how hugely that impacts. So I think there's some real trends there. There's another trend that I'd like to mention is understanding how much your culture is actually supporting burnout when you don't really understand that it is. So what are the systemic things that are going on within the organization? You know, we we want to give our people space to have more well-being and we maybe we might run a couple of um, initiatives, but if we have back-to-back meetings all day, if we've got huge pressures from deadlines and we've not got enough people to deliver on projects and we've got managers sending emails outside of hours, how are we actually going to allow space and time and the mindset for people to really look after their own well-being when our culture doesn't support that? So I think they're the biggest things that we see. Yeah. And I think in the context of this conversation around well-being, actually the identifying the systemic factors that contribute to actual burnout, this has been 
an important point in all of the conversations that we've had within the culture brains community. And so, again, tapping into your wisdom and your expertise, because I know that you specialize in that area. What are the best ways to address these systemic issues that really cannot be addressed through a sort of a grassroots approach? Like this is one of those things where you cannot possibly rely on frontline employees to solve this problem. I mean, obviously, each of us has a certain amount of agency and we can certainly set better boundaries and we can implement some some of self-care practices that we all know uh, work, but we can't always change those systemic issues. So what do you see works? Have you got any success stories to share about that? I know that a lot of people would like to know, where do we start? How do we start chipping away at this? Yes, I've got a great story to share. First of all, it's about collecting data because we can't understand the problem properly until we understand what's actually going on. So collecting data is a big thing. And a success story that I can give you an organization that we worked with last year, there was lots of kind of problems that were coming up in the organization around kind of sales and they had an an M&A and and that wasn't really going very well. And people didn't quite understand what was happening. So we did a lot of data collection with the senior leadership team and we uncovered that there was a big issue around values conflict the values that were being kind of proposed weren't being fully lived by the senior leadership team. And that was impacting everybody in that organization. And we were also uncovered that there there was a very, very big issue around psychological safety and the impact that this was having. Interestingly enough, when we took it to the C-suite, they actually didn't even want to kind of acknowledge the data And I was quite shocked about that. You know, we were sort of showing them this is what's going on. But there was this sort of real resistance to understand how it was impacting the organization. We sort of took a bit of a step back, allowed it to process with them. And then we came back and we designed some content around how to get psychological safety more embedded in the organization and what that would look like. And it had a huge impact when we delivered it. We delivered it to 80 of their senior leaders. And they really understood like how it was impacting. And then they went away and they made some real tangible changes to that organization. Through the M&A, they had like 20 people on the C-suite. They they got rid of half of those people and they streamlined lots of their own processes to make things much more easy for people to understand and how they wanted people to show up more. And it had a huge impact on the organization. And engagement rates went up, happiness went up, If you, you know, measuring happiness and how people felt in their roles. So it was just really helping them to uncover what the real issue was because it was being displaced by silos and other issues between collaboration. There was lots of different things that were happening just because of this one issue. What are some of the things that you can do as a leader to cultivate psychological safety? I'm asking because I know that probably not a lot of leadership teams get any support, frankly, and training around how to do that. So I'm hoping that our listeners can benefit from your advice if you can give us a few pointers around that. The first thing is creating a culture of belonging. So what does that look like? We want people to show up as themselves, but we also have to role model that as leaders. So if we're creating psychological safety ourselves by being authentic and human in the workplace and understanding that in order for us to deliver that and for us to allow our employees to do that, we have to do that first. So I think that's a very simple way initially of creating that psychological safety. And the other thing is around really looking at how we're perceiving failure. I mean, you know, even getting rid of the word failure, but one of the biggest foundations of psychological safety is being able to come with an idea or something that where you're not going to be judged, where you're not going to be rejected, you're going to be accepted. So when we acknowledge failures in ourselves as leaders too, or or times when we maybe haven't 
done what we set out to do and we use it as a, a learning experience and we kind of look at everything as experiments. You know, we can always get better. You touched on that earlier. It's like, you know, it's an uh, evolving journey, isn't it? Everything, us being a human being, but also in the workplace, it's ever evolving. So if we can create foundations that actually support acknowledging of mistakes and then how we learn from those mistakes as opposed to feeling like we're too afraid to make a mistake because then we're kind of constantly having to wear a mask too. So it's about really kind of creating those foundations where people can come and bring their whole selves, where people are not afraid to experiment, where people are they're not feeling excluded because of who they are. They're actually welcomed for their unique, you know, talents and abilities and for their unique perspectives, you know, because when we have diverse perspectives, one of the biggest issues I think around psychological safety as well is groupthink and how dangerous that is to organisations. So we only employ people that look like us or think like us. And that doesn't make a psychologically safe organisation because if you get somebody outside of that, that's coming into that environment, then of course their ideas are not going to be viewed in the same way. So it's about really looking at who we have in our organization, what we want, and, and really kind of looking at how we dissolve groupthink and how we create like these diverse, inclusive cultures, which really support growth and innovation and being human, you know, being human is not perfect. Being human is so multifaceted. And so that is really, I think, the foundational concept of psychological safety. So one thing is be a role model yourself if you are a leader of that vulnerability and openness about who you are and your struggles and your failures and your journey and your evolution as a human being, but also as a, as a leader. And then you say, create that psychologically safe and diverse environment where diverging opinions can be voiced and heard by others. And again, if we were to make it a little bit more specific, like what are the kind of things that leaders can do to encourage that? Because I don't think that it's for lack of good intentions. Uh, very often, you know, I hear from leaders, I really encourage people to, you know, to challenge my ideas or our strategy and people just don't speak up. So <laughs> what's going wrong there? And what are the things, really specific, tangible things that a leader can do to start encouraging that openness and people voicing their opinions more openly, apart from, of course, being a role model, as you say, of openness themselves. So I think it's really about creating a space. If that's the feedback that you're getting and people aren't wanting to bring anything forward or challenge your opinions, then clearly there's something up there in terms of how safe people are feeling. So if people don't feel safe to come to you directly and say that, then create like almost like a psychological safety amnesty where you have a Slack channel or somewhere that people can bring ideas or that people are able to voice what they think. I think that's a really tangible way. And we've seen that really impactful in organizations of, of having this sort of safe space to bring ideas forward rather than sort of directing it at one person, the leader. There's like a, an open box kind of thing. That does really work. And I think within team meetings, you know, creating space where you have a section that's dedicated to let's talk about anything here, anything when we're role modeling our experiences of trust. How do we show that more in our team? So having a section that is allowing space for that, because really it's just about open conversations. You know, unless we create space for that, that's the tangible thing. So it's not anything too extreme. It's, just, it's very simple things. Yeah, I love these ideas. And if I may throw in my two cents around that as well, what I've seen work in the situations, apart from creating those safe spaces, spaces where people can voice their opinions, is for leaders to take a slightly different approach to eliciting those opinions, because simply saying, you know, my door is open or saying poke holes in this idea that is my idea is definitely not enough. 
And I think, you know, one of the easy shifts that a leader can do in how they express that is instead of asking for criticism or even for feedback, asking their people for advice around something. And it suddenly equalizes a little bit the position of the two parties where you are becoming partners in thinking and generating ideas rather than someone criticizing their boss or giving feedback to their boss. And I've seen this very subtle shift really make a difference in the quality of conversations that are being had in in those teams. And I also know that one of the things that helps to create psychological safety with a leader and, and their team is when they can reward and recognize people who have been status quo challengers with them and really acknowledge that publicly and say, Teresa has actually flagged that we have a serious issue, serious risk issue with this proposal. And we looked into it and indeed she was right. And she saved us a ton of time and possibly also some money. And we found an alternative solution. So thank you, Teresa. Well done. And please keep those ideas coming. And I think, you know, just by having examples of people within the team who have challenged the status quo or the way we do things who haven't been punished, but on the contrary, have been recognized and celebrated, this can also break down those barriers to a certain extent. Yeah, 100%. And it just reminds me of something that we kind of share in organizations, which is a game called Boops and Whoops. (laughs) And what it means is that you can nominate somebody for extraordinary work. So that's the Boops. And then the Whoops is you nominate yourself for a time when you've made a mistake. So you nominate yourself in an all hands meeting and you say, hey, I just want to raise this. And then by doing that, it just creates this beautiful culture of psychological safety because not only are you celebrating someone for extraordinary work and a lot of that work, like you said, Agar, is people who are noticing things and who are showing them to the team and then things are changing because of that and they're stepping outside of the normal box and status quo. And then the whoops just really kind of acknowledges what we're learning from these mistakes and how we're growing from them. And it just, it it really has a huge impact, just that little simple exercise. I love that. And, you know, it might seem like such a small thing, but actually I know, and we've seen this because we run culture diagnostic tools. So you can actually see the impact of some of those things on culture long-term that this might seem like a small frivolous thing, but actually when certain stories are repeated over and over again, or certain patterns of behavior start popping up in various places in the organization. This is how your culture shifts. Because culture is really patterns of behaviors. And I always like to say, count to three. If you see a similar behavior happening more than three times, it's already a pattern. And patterns eventually become culture. And it works both ways, right? So when you see something negative, see it more than three times, it's probably a red flag and it's probably a good idea to chat about it with your team to make sure that it doesn't solidify into your culture, into your team culture. And of course, on the flip side of that is the positive thing. If you see more and more of those stories that are worth celebrating or more and more people being vulnerable and admitting to their mistakes, eventually it does become second nature. And that's exactly what you want to do. Mm, definitely. I love that. And you're so right about the, the when it happens times three, you really need to get an eye on that and look to see if it's something you want to continue for sure, because cultures are just made up of patterns of behavior as, as we are as human beings, you know, and our patterns of behavior determine, you know, what our outcomes are. And that's where we really start to get into that whole redesigning culture. Because when we start to see the patterns, we can say, oh, hang on a minute, this isn't quite the way that we want to go. How can we, you know, shift this a little? How can we shift, you know, our thinking around this? How can we shift how we're working together around this? And it has like such a knock on effect. And you mentioned rewards and recognition as well, really looking at, you know, how you appreciate your people and how people acknowledge the different ways that we all like to be appreciated because not everybody likes you know words of affirmation or gift giving like we all have our own unique way of feeling valued 
appreciated. So if we can foster that more into our organizations and create user guides for everybody of, you know, how I like to work, what's my best self at work, what do I find challenging, where do I need support and foster these, you know, very simple ways of working. But once we understand each other and how we all show up in our culture, that has a huge effect because a lot of assumptions that we make about other people are just that, they're assumptions. We don't actually know. We do that so much as human beings anyway. So if we can take the assumption out of it and we know, oh, X likes to be communicated to in this way, or Dave likes to do this work at this time, then we're going to get more best out of people, aren't we? Yes. And I think it's even more important these days in times of remote and hybrid work because people don't spend as much time as they used to together working side by side. And so making these observations about our colleagues are harder and harder. And so I find this idea of the user, you know, manual for me as a, as a colleague, when I'm at my best, what sort of rubs me the wrong way. It's a wonderful shortcut to build those meaningful relationships in the workplace and really set people up for success. So that's a practice that I personally highly recommend as well to everyone. And we're going to put a link in the show notes to examples of those read me or user manual guides that people create for, for themselves and ask of their team members as well to just make the whole process of collaboration so much smoother. Which kind of brings me to the point where, you know, you've mentioned the importance of belonging and like one of the foundations to building well-being in the workplace you've mentioned is making sure that people feel like they belong. And that starts from making people feel seen and valued as individuals. I want to unpack a little bit this whole idea of wellness in the workplace to sort of wrap up our conversation as well. When people think about well-being in the workplace, what are the constituent parts that make this whole? Like, what should we be thinking about? You've mentioned belonging is one of those elements. What else should we be thinking about? Yeah, so well-being is multifaceted. It's not just our physical and mental well-being. It's our sense of belonging, like you say. It's creativity. It's play. It's how we communicate. It's the feedback we get. It's so holistic. So when we start to really look at how are we um, supporting our people to be at their best, what are we doing to support people's mental well-being? You know, how are we going to reduce stress in our workplace? How are we going to encourage people to take more care of their physical well-being? You know, if people are sat in front of their desks for seven hours, that's not creating a, a well-being culture. So it's really about like, how do we as organizations really care for people? You know, how are we compassionate to, to people's needs? And how do we really understand which areas of our culture need us to take a bit of a deeper look in? Where are we creating opportunities to have fun and connect on a, on a meaningful level? You know, where are we supporting people to tap into their creativity? Innovation is what's going to keep business continuing to grow. And if we don't support innovation in our culture, then we're really missing a trick there. Because also when our people are creative, they're in a flow state. And when we're in a flow state, we're in optimal well-being because we're doing something that we genuinely, truly love. We feel great. And it's a joy. It's a pleasure. So why can't we make more intentional experiences in the workplace to support those flow states. That's where we're really tapping into human potential and how we can shift forward into a very different world that we're living in now. Yeah. And to your last point about flow, I think sometimes you don't even have to do too much to enable that. You just need to give people the space because frankly, these days we live in an era of time confetti where People are jumping from one meeting to another and everything feels so incredibly fragmented also with all the distractions. So actually getting into a state of flow becomes more and more challenging. And so sometimes instead of doing things for people saying, maybe we actually don't do anything today and you have a whole day just to catch up with your work. And I know that some organizations 
uh, call these days, getting shit done days. <laughs> and, and actually, it creates a beautiful conditions for, for flow in the workplace without any effort whatsoever. You know, you just cancel all the meetings and that's it. That's it. And it doesn't have to be huge things when it comes to well-being. It's very, very small things that we can do that make such a huge impact. So true. I love that. So let's move to the rapid fire questions. The concept here is that I'm going to ask you five questions in rapid succession. Ideally, we'd love for you to answer these questions, all of them, in two minutes. So as you might know, at Culture Brains, we are on a mission to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. And I'm curious if you only could share one tip with our listeners around how to bring more belonging to the workplace, what would it be? Have more fun. Hmm. What are the signs that the company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? Oh, I think this one's quite hard to answer in two minutes, but I think there's many signs. There's uh, retention rates, there's absenteeism, there's, you know, all the business kind of objectives that we look at and how they're affecting the performance of our company, productivity levels, when they start to be affected, then we know that something's going on. Teresa, do you have any companies that you admire for the culture? And if yes, why? I have lots of companies I admire, but I think my biggest inspiration is Zappos. And I just love what they stand for in terms of employee happiness. And they made it their mission to create a culture that supported employee happiness. And they're now a billion dollar company. This is a question that I think you will have a lot of interesting recommendations. I, I am getting this feeling. What books should our listeners get their hands on? And they don't necessarily have to be books on culture or leadership, but the kind of books that you believe would really help them to think about work differently? Yeah. Oh, I've got so many, but I think there's three that particularly stand out, which first one is Conscious Capitalism, and that's by John Mackey and Raj Sidoda, which I hugely recommend. Another one is um, Search Inside Yourself, which is written by, I've just got his name here, Chad Ming Tan, who is Google's Jolly Good Fellow. He created the Search Inside Yourself course, which is a mixture of mindfulness and emotional intelligence. And I highly recommend that one. And then my third is a book called Exceptional, which is by Daniel Cable, is a business psychologist and social scientist. And it's about how we become exceptional. So how do we live our potential? And he talks about creating like your own personal highlight reel, just as athletes do that to, to achieve their best. So asking your colleagues and your friends and your family, like when when am I at my best? When do you see me at my best? Because unfortunately, how culture our society is, we don't tend to hear about our best or we don't even hear it. It's when we die and we have a beautiful eulogy that says how much of a lovely person we were and how much of an impact that we had in people's lives. Why wait till someone's died? Tell them today. If someone does something that you admire, if somebody does something that you think is incredible or, or you really just, you know, love the way that they show up in the world, tell them, don't don't wait until then, you know? Teresa, I think it's such a great CTA call to action to our listeners. Honestly, just, you know, tell them today what they did that you admired because it, it is so, so true. And I know from time to time, I'm lucky to get notes from our listeners or from our clients. And it has such a huge impact when someone reaches out unprompted to tell you that they appreciate the work that you are doing. Uh, it's such a gift. So definitely, if you are listening to this, just send someone a note or call them and tell them that you admire what they did and what impact it had on you. So final question in this series, what is one thing that our listeners can do literally tomorrow, something simple and straightforward? to build their own culture lab and experiment with cultivating a culture that is going to help them and their teams to achieve their goals and bring their vision to life? Okay, simple thing. Be curious. Start to really look at what you want it to be and then get curious to how you're going to make that happen. Think about when, you, when you're at your best at work and then how you can create that within your teams. I love that. Curiosity is such a big one. Thank you so much, Therese. It was such a wonderful conversation. 
And I want to ask you if our listeners want to learn more about you, about your work, what would be the best places for them to visit, preferably online, since we have a global audience and people are literally around the globe listening to this? I think the best place for people to uh, connect with me is actually on LinkedIn. So my personal profile or through the Wellness Revolution business page, if you'd like to know more about the work that we do within organizations, but definitely LinkedIn. I'm I, I think I put all my energy there, really, because otherwise you can just get too stretched. Wonderful. So we're going to put links in the show notes to your profile, to your website. Thank you again for your time. Thank you again for sharing your wisdom so generously. The most gratitude really that I have to send you away is for the work that you are doing in the world because it's much needed. And we really need a tribe of people transforming organizations to make work what it deserves to be, which is an integral, important part of our lives that can make our lives better. So here's to that. And let's keep going in that direction and creating change. Amazing. Thank you so much for having me on, Agra. It's been a pleasure. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Anis and Labarawi, production manager. Sound producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. Thank you for joining Teresa and me for this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found this conversation interesting or inspiring or valuable, and chances are that you did since you are still listening, you will probably also enjoy the previous conversation that I had with a good friend of mine, Jeanette Bronet. You'll find a link to this episode in the show notes. And if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and follow the Culture Lab podcast in your favorite listening app. And please, please, please do me a personal favor a few second favor and share it, maybe on social or by text or by email, even just with one person. Just copy the link from the app you're using and tell your friends who want to find new, better ways of cultivating a great company culture, tell them to listen and then perhaps chat about what you've both discovered. Because when shows like this become conversations and conversations become actions, well, that's how we transform the workplace culture. And if you want to dive even deeper into the topics and find like-minded peers who are in charge of culture work in their organization, you might consider joining Culture Brain. It's our one-of-a-kind culture accelerator program. It's also a global community of peers who are shaping the future of work. You can learn more at tinyurl.com forward slash culture brains, and you'll find the link in the show notes. And now a quick preview of the next episode. And our next thing is going to be a deep dive with Shani Person and myself. And this time we will explore the possibilities and constraints of remote and hybrid working and the strategies that help us be successful in this new working model. So here is a short preview where Shani talks about the common pitfall when it comes to trying to decide what shade of hybrid is right for your organization or your team. Asking people what they want. Not such a good idea. Not always. And here is Shani talking about what's a better alternative to that. I think we often get stuck with all these surveys and all these questions around these things in the needs versus preference kind of ditch. And those things are not the same. I have preferences, but my preferences, my needs are not necessarily always completely aligned. And I think a lot of times we ask for wish lists instead of actually asking, you know, what are the challenges that you're facing? What would make this easier or more possible for you? We go and we we ask them for the actual solution. And I think that's where we are with this discussion is, do you want to be at home or do you want to be there? No, don't ask that. <laughs> ask, what do you need to collaborate? I need this, whatever the answer is. To add some flavor to that, then I think it's also possible to 
from employees kind of take that input in a different way as well. So not having asked, well, X amount of people want to stay at home. No, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about what it is they want to be able to achieve and what is the best way for them to do that. Thanks again for tuning in. If you want to get free resources on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser, agabayer.com forward slash resources. If you haven't subscribed to The Culture Lab yet, please do it now. That's the best way you can support our work. And finally, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on the platform that you listen to. Thank you. And you are amazing for listening to this point. Not many people do.